thank you everyone for joining us. We have a great pitch event for you today. We have five um, outstanding companies and two panelists. I'll let them go ahead and introduce themselves now. Um, Jonathan, if you want to start us off. Sure thing. Uh, my name is Jonathan Crowder. I'm a partner at Intellis Capital, and we tend to focus on early stage technology businesses accelerating the energy transition. Uh, got a deep background in the space. I've been in and around it for 10 years, both a, at a policy center and, and also at a Klein and Perkins Beck startup, and excited to participate in today's event. Awesome. Thank you. And then, Brian, if you can also do so. Yeah, I'm uh, Brian McCullough from the Ride Home Fund. Um, as you can see by my <clears throat> slightly bigger mic setup here, uh, the Ride Home Fund is based out of the Tech Meme Ride Home podcast, which 70,000 of the most connected people in Silicon Valley listen to every single day. Um, the superpower of our fund, since it's focused mostly on early stage, is that all of our portfolio companies have the opportunity to launch themselves on the podcast uh, in their own words, launch their legend, as we say. Um, we're only a year old, but um, we've uh, invested in 25 companies over the last 12 months, and uh, we're going to do another 20 more this year. So, um, yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, so we're going to do eight to 10 minute pitches today with, you know, five to seven minutes depending how the time works after for Q&A per company. Um, I'm gonna be running a timer. So Hall, I'm actually gonna let you take it from here so I can do that on the back end. Um, and if anybody in the audience has any questions about companies uh, during, you can put those in the chat box and we'll hopefully you have time to get to those. Great, thanks Shane. Uh, my name is Hall Martin. I'm the CEO and founder of 10 Capital and wanna welcome everybody for joining us today. We have some great pitches here and we have two investors on the panel that will lead the questions, but look forward to your questions in the audience as well. With that, let's go and kick it off with our first presenter. Each one's gonna get about 15 minutes for a pitch and Q and A. And so if you kick it off, Michael, thanks for joining us. No, thanks Hall for the introduction. Uh, my name is Mike Jacobs. I'm the founder of uh, Kitchen Data Systems. And uh, sorry for the background noise, I'm actually pitching uh, two VCs in Palo Alto right now. Uh, so if you're over in uh, Palo Alto, stop by. We're at Sundance Steakhouse and uh, taking a quick break for the event. And ultimately, uh, you know, it's my third restaurant tech company. I have two exits. And uh, what, we're, what we're doing right now uh, is we're completing a two and a half million pre-seed round, uh, 10 million safe. We're going to be doing a seed round in Q1 of next year. And ultimately the problem that we're solving is that small, medium restaurants, uh, they tend to go out of business because they're spending too much on their costs. Uh, now there's a lot of other, uh, a lot of other macro events that uh, you know, are being blamed for this, but ultimately, if you look at what they're spending on their cogs versus a larger uh, restaurant group, like let's say a cheesecake factory, you'll see that they're spending about 50% more for every item that they're ordering for their menu. And they're also uh, to decrease these uh, cost of goods sold as much as possible, potentially ordering from 20 to 30 plus vendors. So uh, ultimately what, uh, what we've done is we've created a method for uh, signing up all of our uh, restaurants to a group purchasing program that uh, saves them on uh, every single item that they're buying. And it uh, uh, gets them the same buying power as the Cheesecake Factory. So uh, ultimately we're scaling very fast. And here's how we did it. So it's a three-part solution. Uh, you know, we've uh, created digital restaurants. So if anybody's familiar with the restaurant industry uh, as it's uh, in its current incarnation, you'll see that there's influencers like uh, Mr. Beast from YouTube that can launch a national restaurant chain and uh, become very big very quickly. So uh, we've created a two-sided marketplace that's very similar to that, that lets any, anybody with a brand, it could be an influencer, it could be a restaurant, uh, we have some clients on that end that are also restaurants that want to scale quickly and affordably that uh, really just let them uh, create a, a delivery menu and launch it on DoorDash and Uber Eats, et cetera, uh, without actually going through the motions of launching a restaurant because we connect them with uh, one of 45,000 restaurants in our network 
that have already said yes to launching a, a very similar concept like a Mr. Beast burger. Now, uh, once a restaurant agrees to do that, we get them onboarded to our Kitchen Savers program, which uh, you know is ultimately in partnership with a company called Cisco, which is the largest uh, distributor in the world. They have seven hundred thousand clients, and uh, you, you know, and they're uh, working with us. We're the first company that has this type of partnership that gives th uh, this level of pricing to small, medium businesses. And they're really excited to work with us. It's been a great partnership. Our first clients with this application are actually uh, starting to order their food right now. Uh, and then on the other end, uh, the brands uh, like the Mr. Beast Burger, et cetera, have a lot of problems uh, getting a reorder. Uh, they'll get a first order, but not a reorder. So we've created a better programmable uh, affinity program that uh, really lets uh, any of these brands uh, engage with their fans where they're, uh, where they're at on their phones uh, using an SMS application. Uh, and, that's, uh, and that keeps their brand growing as, they're, as we're scaling the locations. Now, it's a, it's a really large market. Uh, there's uh, nearly a million restaurants in the United States and Canada uh, on third party delivery. And we've targeted about 45,000 of them to start that, uh, that really understand the space and are already working within the business models that I'm describing. And we can scale outside of that group uh, later on. But uh, to tell you the truth, pretty much everybody that we're speaking to from those 45,000 restaurants are telling us yes. So our sales reps are only calling uh, people from that, uh, from that group. Now, business model wise, uh, here's how it works. Uh, some of the brands that we're working with, like let's say Powerbomb Pizza, it pays, uh, it's in about 60 locations right now. They pay us $250 per month per brand. And they also split the loyalty revenue with us. Uh, you, you know, uh, and then restaurants that we're working with end up paying what turns out to be, uh, if you do all the math, around 20% of the cost saving. So uh, if you're, let's say, a typical pizzeria, you buy about $160,000 worth of cheese and flour and tomatoes uh, every year. Uh, it, on the Kitch Savers program that we created, that goes down uh, usually to about 115. Uh, thousand, and then we would take about 20% of the savings uh, for running the program. Now, we're already national. We're in, uh, this map's a little old, actually. We're in uh, over 30 states at the moment, uh, and we're uh, launching new locations every day. Uh, these are some of our brands. The one that's the highest volume, because everyone already asked that, is actually Man versus Fries which uh, was a, and still is a, a client with one of our competitors. Uh, uh, they came to us with 95 existing locations and, um, and about 22 million in top line revenue from 2021. Uh, what we're doing with them is scaling them uh, even faster into more locations. And uh, the reason why they're working with us is because instead of uh, taking 5% of the bottom line revenue uh, when working with the competitor, which is a company called Reef, uh, we're actually letting them take about 30% of the revenue uh, based on our model. Now, uh, that's it for my, uh, for my pitch. Uh, looking forward to uh, feedback. Uh, Brian, Jonathan, who wants to go first? Go for uh, Brian. Okay, I will. So is this, Michael... Um, specifically, it sounds like you're targeting chains, franchises, and things like that. Is this specifically a scale thing? Like if I just want to have one or two pizzerias uh, locally, is this not for me? Or can you uh, work with uh, different size operations? Yep. So we work with anyone that has typically under 100 locations. So, uh, so when you're buying as a restaurant, if you have 100 locations, you, you have much more buying power than if you, uh, if you don't. So our largest client, uh, that's a restaurant, has 54 locations in Texas. And uh, uh, it's a chain hall called uh, Mr. Jim's Pizza. Uh, 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 nice guys out there. And ultimately, uh, we still can get them savings uh, on their purchasing. 
you, you know, and then they're launching a brand called Dancing Pizza, which is uh, uh, a set of Dancing with the Stars champions that have about 10 million followers on social media, and each one has a different pizza that they're promoting. Well, the, real quick, the reason that I, I asked this, and then I'll, I'll move on, is uh, the, uh, it, it, what is what has gotten the most traction for you? Is it the group buying and the savings, or is it the affinity program? Because again, if I were a smaller, uh, maybe that would is what I'd be interested in, or maybe not. I don't know. So, which which has get, gotten the most traction in terms yep. of what do what do restaurants value more? Yeah. So the restaurants don't care about the affinity program yet. <laughs> uh, so the uh, that's really good for the brands because uh, they get one or two orders from somebody, but the reorder rate from one of these brands is really bad because they don't have a system for uh, attracting the same com uh, consumers again and again. So the program itself can automatically remind fans, hey, why don't you order another dancing pizza? Here's what's going on with the dancing pizza right now. Now, the restaurants are working with us for the for the group buying program, which we're calling Kitch Savers, because that's saving them uh, a minimum of 25% on everything that they're purchasing. Uh, and literally, they have to do nothing new. Uh, they Most of them already have a Cisco account. They're on the Cisco route. Uh, even if they don't, uh, they see the savings, and they can uh, just log into their portal, uh, the Cisco portal. And uh, not only do they get uh, cheaper food, but they get better payment terms. So instead of having to pay COD or with a, with two hour payment terms, uh, we can get them seven day payment terms, uh, which decreases the number of drops they need to take every week because they can order more food at once, which uh, most of these restaurants are uh, working in a what a startup would call a nightmare scenario where they have less than one month of burn in the bank. So they literally keep you know, they have to buy a, a minimum amount of food every day, like five to seven drops a week, uh, and then basically make and sell the food before they can buy more food. Really hard business. And, uh, and we solve those problems for them. Jonathan? Yeah, one of the, actually, I think there's a, this is a multi-part question, but, but before we dive into it, remind me how many full-time employees there are currently? Uh, about 12. About 12. Can you give me a sense? You know, one of the things that I was a really high level takeaway for me as you were walking through the pitch is just that there's a huge amount of organizational complexity because you've got effectively three product lines. Uh, mm -hmm. And, and I want to get a sense, and I'm, you know, it's not my space. And so it may be just my, my naivete, but can you give me a sense of how the, this notion of, you know, housing a, a purchasing platform, a SaaS affinity program, two-sided promotional marketplace with influencers and celebrities, how all those things make sense together holistically under the same roof. Um, because obviously it would be easier for you to just do one of them. So there's a reason you're doing all three together. Yeah, well, the uh, distributor would never work with us if we were just gonna be a group buying uh, organization. Uh, the only reason why they're working with us uh, is because uh, we have a hundred restaurants. So, uh, and while they're not really our restaurants, they're all signed to be under our umbrella. Uh, and uh, because we have the 100 plus restaurants, we can buy with the same purchasing power as a cheesecake factory. So, so literally it's a life changing uh, decision for any of these restaurants to decide to work with us, uh, especially the ones that are under 10 locations. And so that's, that's number one. And then the affinity program is part of my more long-term vision and uh, ultimately uh, uh, you, you know, we wouldn't know who any of our consumers are unless we did that, right? So there's a lot of companies in the space that say they're a data company, but they're not because uh, all they have is uh, kind of like random ordering data uh, from like uh, somebody named Jen F in Menlo Park ordered a pizza at 2 p.m. on Wednesday. So what, right? So we're actually collecting user data instead of spending uh, $55 plus per user for acquisition, we're actually getting paid to do it. Got it. You said something there about the long-term vision. What is the long-term kind of platonic ideal version of Kitch Data? So if you ever go to, uh, if you ever go to a restaurant conference, which, you know, it's actually kind of fun. I recommend it, uh, especially the Las Vegas Pizza Expo, because if you like pizza, it's, uh, it's a good time. Uh, 
the problem uh, that everybody brings up is third party delivery. So uh, they say that uh, basically that DoorDash and Uber Eats are evil, and uh, which I disagree with, but, uh, uh, but I have a better understanding of what they're trying to do, right? But uh, the restaurants really don't like them. And uh, ultimately the reason for that is uh, DoorDash, Uber Eats, et cetera, are charging 30 to 40% on every order. I've seen it as high as 45%. And uh, restaurants margins are normally like 5%. <laughs> so uh, imagine trying to sell the same stuff with that margin. That's why when you order on DoorDash, you can buy a $40 sandwich, right? <laughs> so, uh, so what we're trying to do is we're building that user base and that, that, that data because uh, at some point we will be a first party ordering platform, uh, a little bit more modern. Uh, imagine like a, a Web3 wallet that lets you order food and, that nobody even knows is a Web3 wallet. It works with your credit card and uh, works with all the restaurants you like and lets you just order. So that's, that's what it's going to be. Uh, for now, it's a loyalty program. And then, uh, and then of course, uh, the celebrity brands and all, and so the restaurants that are scaling with us, uh, those aren't gonna go away. They're, we're just gonna have more and more brands signing up on our platform, working with restaurants, uh, et cetera. And, uh, and then uh, my favorite part is the, uh, is the purchasing organization where we've, we've solved what really is the number one problem with restaurants, which is uh, when you're uh, spending twice as much for the same product on the same day from the same uh, distributor, uh, because uh, you, you haven't figured out how to purchase your ingredients correctly, uh, you know, you're going to go out of business. And, uh, you know, so we fixed that and we have a great partner uh, out of Houston, Texas, uh, Cisco, that's, uh, that's really like keen to help the restaurants do better too. So uh, we've created some technology that helps us work with Cisco in a manner that just makes a lot more sense and uh, for, the, for the, the large company. And, uh, you, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's going to be the most important invention uh, tech-wise, uh, software-wise in the restaurant industry pretty much ever uh, because these small restaurants are going to compete uh, at the same scale as like a TGI Fridays, et cetera. And uh, to tell you the truth, when you hear a lot of people in uh, Silicon Valley, where I'm at right now, or Los Angeles or New York talking about why these Midwestern families uh, take, uh, go out and they go to like Applebee's for dinner, like as a family night, uh, you know, the reason why is it's just too expensive to go anywhere else. <laughs> and, Great, Michael. I yeah. appreciate that. That's a good answer. Thanks so much. Uh, we're at the end of our time. I want to thank you guys for the good questions and Michael for the great pitch. And uh, with that, let's move on to our next one, which is Betsy Ehrenberg of Legacy Concierge. Betsy? Hi, how are you? Doing thank good, you so doing much. Good. I'm going to play, share my screen. And there we are. You know, we've just heard about food for about 15 minutes and all I can think of doing is having lunch. But <laughs> Um, I'm here to present Legacy Concierge, and we are a company that protects wealth after a person passes away. You probably wonder why we're doing this. We learned that every year over $60 billion worth of assets go unclaimed. And when death occurs, people don't know how to find them. In addition, there are a whole bunch of bad actors out there so that one out of every eight deaths results in identity or other theft and loss. What are they trying to do? What are the actors going after? They're going after the 200 plus accounts that every person has. Why do they have them? Everything's electronic, whether it's email, financial, government, or housing. How big is this market? 3.3 million people die each year in the United States. So what was our solution? We had to locate and protect the wealth. We did it in three different ways. First, uncover the accounts, find out where they are, and look at them and say, are they subject to being stolen? And we do a vulnerability report. Second thing, we organize the data 
into eight major categories in an encrypted cloud-based vault called the Legacy Vault. It can be shared by any number of people, whether they're family members or professionals or attorneys, or just kept by the creator. And then the third thing we do, the most important and unique thing, is to go out to custodians and let them know the records you have on file belong to a deceased person, and we, Legacy Concierge, are authorizing you to close the account, freeze the account, or transfer the assets. Those three products work together. Discovery, find out what's out there and how vulnerable people are. And in the process, we build our second product, the Legacy Vault, an annual subscription, cloud-based encrypted, unlimited number of data and documents. And we never store social security numbers. We do not store uh, passwords. Then upon death or disability, we look at what is in the vault, go out to custodians and tell them records you have on file belong to a deceased person. What makes us unique? Well, first of all, we were the first movers in this area. And we realized that we had to have unlimited data and documents, no passwords. Secondly, we spent about a year figuring out how do you close accounts? And we call that connect. And um, we know that Chase changes their rules every 35 days. The IRS changes their rules once a year. Bank of America changes who you contact every month. So we know these rules and we keep them updated. Third, we do lawful support. Every state has different rules. Federal government has certain rules as well. So we know those rules are part of our connect process. Fourth, we find the records with our auto grab. Very, very interesting technology. When you're interested, we'll tell you how it works, maybe. And the tech is stable. As the first mover, we started using it April 2018th. We released the product July 2019. How big is this market? Well, I mentioned 3.3 million people die each year. The average cost for discovery, vault, and administration is $7,500. And that would mean $24 trillion a year. That's nuts. We'll never do that. So how about the market that has wills? That's 20% of the market. $5 trillion, still nuts. So let's come down to what we're able to do, the high net worth subset. 5% of that market, $250 billion per year. This year, next year, the year after. 3.3 million people die each year. Our go-to market had to be two different parts. B2B, which we launched initially to go through the professional firms, the law firms, the CPAs, the wealth managers, and convince them that they had to help their customers find those digital assets in addition to all the work they were currently doing. The second thing was to actually go out to the customer and say, you need this service. You don't want bad actors stealing the assets that someone in your family worked very hard to earn. So where are we? We have already invested over a million dollars in the company and we are seeking an additional $2 million to be spent on launching our marketing and uh, to uh, improve our engineering. You can see what the terms are. Who is the team? These are our leaders. Of course, I'm the founder. And we have a couple of co-founders, Damon Altamar, uh, quite experienced in the security area, the medical uh, security area, as well as financial. He knows this business backwards and forwards. Kurt Doty, who's on the phone, is an exceptional marketeer. And Dan Gravel, our CFO, is working with us. Um, our advisors come from financial areas, the legal areas, as well as Google, technical. We needed to understand how to uh, get in Google accounts. Um, our investors here are six of the 15. A lot of times people say, why in the world would you choose to solve this problem? So I will let you read this cartoon. Okay. 
turns out that we get a lot of requests. We want to have a, um, a memorial service for the decedent. Can you get all those pictures off of Facebook or Google or Apple? The answer is yes. We do it legally. We have good relationships with the flag companies, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Apple and Google. And here we are following the rules for the ABA set up, and then each state had to actually handle them. So let's get started. Do you have any questions about what we're doing and why we need to raise money? Jonathan, you want to go first? Absolutely. This is such a fascinating space. Um, I, I certainly can can sympathize with the the challenges having watched my my dad being an executor for for his father's will uh of how of how difficult that process can be i'm i'm, I'm curious a, a bit about how you thought about go to market i imagine that this uh, and maybe this is an incorrect assumption i can imagine the challenges one of the challenges with this being people often understand that they need this later in life. And by that point, some of those assets are already hidden or lost to them. Is that not the case? Uh, at, yes. <laughs> um, our major market is sort of the 45 to 55 year old people who uh, say, oh my goodness, my parents are getting old. Maybe I have to get them organized. But mom and dad don't know where anything is. So we do discovery then we build the vault, we share it with the person who asked us. And then upon death or disability, we go in, redo discovery, um, update the vault and then uh, do it. The other group are the baby boomers. They uh, realize that uh, number one, they're spending 27 hours a week on Facebook and they become aware of this through their annual meetings with their tax preparer with a financial planner, their wealth manager, maybe even their attorney. Interesting, 80% of the work that we do is with women. Women end up handling a lot of this work and they say, we need help. They're willing to ask for help. And that's why the business is coming primarily from women. So the marketing had to be two phases. One update and educate the professionals and explain to them laws were in place and they could be sued for malpractice if they do not protect the value of the estate. That's the reality. There have been two lawsuits so far and my colleagues are in London this week talking to a group of solicitors there about this solution. So have I answered your question? Absolutely. Just one more before I hand it off. Walk me through the security implications of this as a centralized custodian of all of the account tokens and methods for withdrawing assets, transferring ownership of assets. Um, I assume, and I don't know if this is within the current scope, but in the case of particularly high net worth individuals, they may have ownership in, in trusts and a variety of different types of private funds. Um, how have you thought about the security implications of that? First of all, we do not um, look at the accounts at all. We do not have passwords upon death. The custodians do not require passwords. So that's an unknown fact, but that's the reality. We are not impersonating the user. We're doing a notification. Records you have on file belong to a deceased person. The fiduciary has asked us through a power of attorney to ask you to freeze the account, lock the account, or transfer it from this account to another account that the user has set up. That's the end of our responsibility. We never look into the contents of the account at all. We do have an insurance policy of cybersecurity with one million dollars worth of coverage. Should anyone think we have looked at anything? Um, the vault holds information and that's a uh, tells the creator, which can uh, be legacy concierge when, if they created it after death, or the attorney or family member 
where are the accounts? That's all we care about. We will never look in the accounts. Great. And Brian, what's your question? It's, it is sort of on the legal end of things, but um, so you, you just said that, that you don't know, you wouldn't know the, the dollar figures, you wouldn't know what's inside these 200 different accounts. However, you're still dealing with something that it gets in front of the courts all the time. So if you did have access to this, how do you prevent yourself from constantly being dragged into like probate and will cases and things like that? Because you would be, especially with aggrieved parties that can't have access to these accounts or and want them, uh, and you would have the access. How, how would you deal with or how would you think about dealing with constantly being dragged into court as sort of like, um, you know, agents, okay. I guess, yeah. Um, our terms and conditions and the scope of our responsibility is all written in fine print, but you can read it, it's on our website. Once again, we are notifying the custodians. The records you have on file belong to a deceased person. Please acknowledge that you know that and please take the following action. We're not going into the accounts. We're forcing the custodian to take an action. It's a very big difference. I do, I do see that's a fine line. I'm, I'm just wondering to what degree, because you can force the custodian to act um, if, if he would constantly be uh, requested to do that on behalf of, of certain parties. But uh, let, me, let me ask one more real quick. Um, sure. The, the scale of this. Um, you know, we're all familiar with things like Plaid and, and other companies that do hooks into like, say, bank accounts and things like that. Um, are you having to do each and every case by hand or is there a scalable solution to, to this sort of thing in terms of, again, if you're just the agent and you're just notifying the custodians, I can see that's incredibly scalable. But um, is, is there some sort of a software solution that makes this sort of thing easier than having a ton of workforce having to do each and every case by hand? No, we're doing the notification and we're um, through a ticketing system. We are able to know whether or not the person we contacted responded to the ticket. And then we know it's closed and we have timelines. Um, and if a custodian like Bank of America does not acknowledge that they have frozen the account, the software automatically sends an email to the person who asked us to do the work. We are unable to do this work because the custodian has refused to work with us. So we, I mean, this is all um, very, very automated on a ticketing system. Occasionally we have found that the custodian will not work with us and therefore we have affiliate attorneys in key locations, Florida, New York, Connecticut, Los Angeles, and San Francisco, who will in fact take over the case uh, but we are not the attorneys. We are the background mice um, just creating um, a ticketing system that is activated once the locket administration begins. I'm very happy to show you how it works. <laughs> very scalable. That was a big thing. It is. Great, great. Thank you, Betsy. And thank you guys for great questions. Let's go ahead and Move on to our next presenter, which is Robert Orr. And Robert, if you could launch and carry on afterwards. Uh, we will have the opportunity to set up one-on-ones with these guys after the meeting. So we're looking forward to set, set those up for later this week. Robert, go ahead. Hello, my name is Robert Orr. I'm the co-founder, president, and CEO of Life360 Innovations. My co-founder, Ken, was diagnosed with prostate cancer after retiring from a 50-year career in aircraft maintenance. The best treatment, op treatment op option for Ken was a removal of his prostate, which left him incontinent, a common side effect that will have to manage for the rest of his life. He was sitting on his couch watching a hockey game, and his wife walked by and said, you smell like an old man. And that was the moment that inspired Ken to kind of plug the drain and lead to the creation of its first of its kind, male urethral insert. After helping Ken from the side of my desk for a few years, it was clear this is a common problem with poor treatment options available and Catino needed to get to market. As a result, I left a successful career in finance to create Life360 Innovations and commercialize Catino. In the US, one in four men over 40 experience UI. Adult diapers are the main treatment option 
and are an undignified symptom management tool that is largely unsatisfactory and unsustainable. There's a very large unmet need and the addressable market just in the US and EU slash UK is approximately 15 million men. We have developed the Catino, a class two Health Canada licensed self-administered non-surgical medical device designed to help men overcome the impacts of UI and promote a healthy bladder function. Catino is available in a direct to consumer subscription model at $100 a month with a 95% contribution margin. Contino is an entirely new approach to managing male UI as it inserted into the urethra, keeping urine in the bladder, which helps the urinary system function as it was intended. It's easy to use without pain or cut discomfort, and training and support is provided by experienced medical professionals. Life360 Innovation is led by an experienced healthcare and finance veterans with which work experience and prior experience at J&J, Pfizer, Tenya, PwC. Everybody in the team is kind of 20 plus years. Catino is priced on a subscription basis against adult diapers, which are at least 80, if not more to 80% or more of the market. Collection de devices are generally not that effective and clamps are kind of cheap and simple, but are hated by the medical community and, and result in some significant adverse events. Surgery is an option, but not that available due to costs and the medical risk, uh, risks related to the demographic. Go to market has been tested and we are ready to scale in Canada. We commercially launched in BC after COVID-19 restrictions were lifted in April. We have 20 plus commercial distribution agreements in place in BC. Mm -hmm. Our foundational study demonstrated medical and statistical significant results, which was published in the Canadian Rally Journal. We have an innovative and lean distribution strategy, which leverages existing referral networks and the expertise of medical professionals already treating this condition. Our quality management system is ISO 1345 compliant uh, to US, EU, and Canadian standards. And our 1,200 page technical file has been submitted to the EU and, and been accepted, but for some additional clinical data, which is underway. And we have 70 plus utility and design patents granted. This is a snapshot of our customer economics and traction. Initially, we're focusing on a digital marketing uh, plan until our medical referral market develops over time. Cost of acquiring a customer is about 15% uh, compared to our lifetime value, which is about 4,500, which provides flexibility in our pricing and our, and our ability to increase marketing costs as needed. Again, this is a, uh, oops. Yeah. Since COVID restrictions lifted, uh, this is a snapshot over kind of the last five months. Cost per trial are trending as expected. So with low volumes and other things in early parts of the, the rollout, you could see our cost of acquisition of a booking was like 700 to 2000 bucks. But really at the end of the day, it was low volume. And Facebook was learning, uh, you know, our, our kind of, uh, you know, what is our intended audience. So our cost of uh, trial is, is trending down as expected. You know, our qualified leads are getting better. The cost per lead is trending down and our trials and users are uh, growing month to month. This is a high level snapshot of our expected results in five years with US and EU uh, market entry uh, considered in uh, 2024. As you can see, we do not need to uh, need a significant concentration of the addressable market to be highly profitable, as you can see from our projected revenue and EBITDA. Raising a Series A preferred with the bulk of the uh, funds, you know, raised going into sales and marketing and market entry prep. We've also identified three Canadian government grants that we are well suited for and should be able to double up our capital with some non-dilutive financing. Why invest? We're ready to scale in, uh, in Canada. We bring significant innovation to a market with a large unmet need. We have a lean and innovative distribution strategy with high margin and a direct-to-consumer subscription model. We've had 60 plus investors already invest with virtually all investing multiple times. We expect to be acquired and go public after demonstrating commercial uh, traction kind of in the EU, US and EU and approximately three years into a robust med tech market. Contact me to learn more. There we go. Great, thanks. Brian, you want to kick off the questions here? Sure. So um, we kind of skipped over a key important part of um, the first customer experience. Uh, am, am I? Did I hear you right that essentially you have to send people 
uh, to train folks the first time they use this, which would make sense to me. I'd be afraid yeah. to try it myself on my own the first time. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, I, we think actually over time we may be a, a pure direct-to-consumer, but initially we're certainly leveraging the existing medical medical market. So in Canada, which is – we don't have the same kind of concentration of healthcare mm -hmm. In in uh, like you might have Kaiser Permanente that captures a massive part of the market. We don't have those types of players in Canada. So just to give you a sense of it, uh, there's 250 or 300 unique pelvic floor physiotherapy practices across Canada that treat men for urinary incontinence. Uh, so very very specific. They're already treating them. So we're leveraging groups like that. We've also got a series of urologists mm -hmm. that are in private practice and nurses that are actually treating incontinence as well. So we identify the customer, we train them and prepare them for the patient or for the, for the first uh, mm -hmm. patient fitting. We have an experienced medical professional do that fitting with them and then potentially do a follow-up if necessary. And then our nurse team actually continues to onboard that customer for the next uh, kind of two to three weeks. But to be clear, the process is um, I go to one of the specialists to their office Yep. I, I am trained. Yep. Uh, maybe I do it myself in the office. But Correct. again, when I go home to do it for myself for the first time, I'm doing it for myself for the first time. You are, but we also have a nurse uh, that is a Life360 nurse that calls you actually at that first day. We've got a series of, of interventions. that they, they actually start before that first meeting. Mm. So we have a couple of interventions before that. We get them to do a bladdery diary. We prepare them into the onboarding process of how the how they're going to prepare their body to use the product, and then we actually follow up quite uh, pretty much every couple of days for the first uh, three or four days, or so this, the first uh, sorry three or four weeks. Uh, this is along the same line, but this is my last one, real quick. Um, yeah. What have you seen in terms of the percentage retention? Is the wrong word, but people <laughs> that have successfully. Uh, taking it home and start to use it regularly. Like is what is the, what is the retention of people being able to do this successfully three months out, six months out, et cetera. Yeah. We don't have enough data necessarily for that, but we have been testing our systems pretty significantly. And when, you know, we didn't have the type of pre preparation for the customer, uh, we'd have a uh, dropouts very quickly. They would try yeah, after a couple of days and they would drop out. They go, oh, no, this doesn't work for me. And so what we've learned from that process, we had an expectation that the nurses would actually do a better job. Sorry, the, the physiotherapist would do a better job. And when it turned out that they weren't, we recognized that we needed to prepare the customer better before that first meeting and then through that first week. So that's just, that actually that issue has gone away basically with our additional uh, support. And we're in the process of putting together a bunch of series of videos and other things just to support that once we know exactly what the process is. So, and then in terms of long-term users, we have a number of users that are multiple years. Uh, one of our, our inventors has been using the product for actually 10 plus years. And then we've got some early trial participants that are kind of in the five, six year range. Every day, five, six years, no adverse events, change their life. Thanks. Yeah. Great, thanks. Jonathan? So with any medical device, uh, and you, you just touched on it briefly, but I'd love to hear more about your IP strategy, existing portfolio of assets, defensibility around that. Yeah, I mean, it's actually been one of the more significant things we did while we were um, in the development phase, in the R&D phase. We basically have three families of, of patents. We have an original base patent that was filed in 2009. Uh, and then it was granted, the U.S. Uh, patent was granted, oops, uh, I can't remember exactly, probably six or seven years later. Uh, and then we've, subsequent to that original filing, we've done some evergreening. So we've got three additional utility patents. We've, we've sat on top of that, all of which have been granted in the major markets and or in, or in the kind of last part of the prosecution phase. Um, we've also done the design, uh, design patents in all the key markets in which we expect, plus utility patents in those markets. So the key markets we've actually defended, defended are Europe. We've got 10 countries in Europe, U.S., Canada, Mexico, India, uh, Brazil, Israel, Japan, China, Hong Kong, Macau, uh, South Korea. And then in terms of, so we've done disclosures that we think are helpful on the patent work. We've got three different families. And then we've limit, we limit uh, access to our IP, which we've, we've, provided, we've done that the whole time. Excellent. Thank you. Um, one more 
Can you give me a sense of the expected cost and time just to navigate the approval processes for other markets, whether it's the FDA in the United States or as you enter Europe? We're confident that we can do it in the time frame. Like the 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 technical file and our user experience and our foundational study, we're not expecting significant time frames. Call it a year, basically. Our, our like I said, our year our European file, which is a twelve hundred page technical file, was reviewed and accepted, but for some additional clinical evidence. And the the difference in Canada to Europe was that it's a slightly higher class, risk classification in Europe, so they wanted more clinical data, which is underway. So we expect um, we're not expecting that to be a significant hurdle. Reimbursement is another thing. Uh, reimbursement in Europe will take a little bit of time. We're confident that we can uh, function in, in U.S. and Canada without reimbursement, although a reimbursement will get eventually. Uh, the those two markets essentially the consumer is paying for this product on their own, anyways. Whereas in Europe, uh, they're underwriting the cost of uh, basically all incontinence products in general terms. Yeah, with at that price point, I would think that that reimbursement would be a is a nice to have, but not certainly not a need it's, to have. In those yeah, markets. it's yeah, and it's in fact we actually think uh, we have a similar Canadian companies functioning in the U.S. Similar in terms of dealing with urology and a similar distribution strategy. The take up on the medical side is quite strong. Uh, the ecosystems want additional um, additional visits essentially to their ecosystem. And so that's their, their system was similar to ours as well. Although I'm pleased to say we did ours first. What's the process of building partnerships with new medical practitioners in the field? It's not that difficult. I mean, really, uh, you know, we attended the Canadian Urology Conference, uh, you know, three or four months ago. Uh, we didn't have a single intervention with a, uh, with a urologist or a nurse that's working in this space that didn't say large unmet need, uh, lot, no existing treatments are terrible, and how do I get involved? And so uh, we ended up signing three or four urologists right out of the gate. One of the urologists basically said, I'm not even going to charge you. This is such an important thing. Just let me let me set up and help my patients, basically. So it's not that difficult. It's a little bit cumbersome in terms of training, but ultimately we're using medical professionals that are already experienced in this space. Wonderful. Thanks so much. Yeah. Brian, you have another question? You have just a minute and a half. Uh, no, but I, I'm just the the go to market is you, you mentioned the Facebook ads and and Google ads and things like that. So are you going to the consumer first, or you're just it's both? Looking, it's it's yeah. oh it's a it's a it's a dual market. So we've got a professional salesperson that's ex Pfizer that goes and details the urology and 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 do you do you have a sense of what you would target for the initial go to market more heavily the practitioners or the direct to consumer? Uh, direct to consumer. It's a patient. It's a patient drive model, basically. I mean, the patients. I mean, quite frankly, the medical community has basically ignored and forgotten about this group. Uh, incontinence is really kind of not well treated. Uh, you'll talk to you'll talk to some GPs, and they'll say, "Oh, I don't have any incontinence people," and then you'll talk to the talk to the underlying uh, you know customers, and like they're it's rampant. Ten percent of the Canadian population has got incontinence, so that just gives you a sense of how of the adult population. So, I mean, it's, uh, I mean, the numbers are staggering and it's ignored and basically, uh, really at the end of the day, the healthcare system ends up underwriting other costs that are associated with incontinence and loneliness, depression, all kinds of other stuff come down. There's lots of, lots of bad stuff. And we actually have a big kind of clean tech angle here too. The typical user for us would throw away, um, you know, call it five, 3000 diapers in a year, 2000 diapers in a year or some crazy amount and <laughs> it's untreated urine going into the water table and ours, we don't do any of that stuff. So it's a massive kind of clean tech angle too. I see my 15 is up, but I'm happy to answer more questions if necessary, but I know Hall's got lots to get through here. Great. Thanks for that. And we'll try to set up some one-on-ones afterwards, uh, Robert, great pitch. And with that, let's go to our final presenter, Brandon Garrett of Electric Playhouse. Brandon, can you go ahead and load your slides up and let's kick off your pitch. Oh, well, thank you. Hey guys, how's everybody? Thanks for the opportunity this afternoon. Uh, can you guys see my screen now? Yes, we can. Yes. Awesome. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Electric Playhouse, and we're a location-based entertainment company based in Albuquerque, New Mexico. We opened in 2018, closed with the pandemic after six weeks, team did a bunch of museum work, reopened last summer, and essentially what we're doing is we're finding opportunity to bring new foot traffic and a wide demographic to various shopping centers and malls throughout the country. 
uh, in our initial raise, we raised 5 million Series A. And now the company is in a position for growth. And so we're targeting our essentially flagship location, which will be in Las Vegas, right off the Las Vegas Strip. And what we do is, uh, what's unique about Electric Playhouse is we're a full turnkey solution. So from design to operation, we build the facilities, we manage them, and we build all the content and experiences with it within them themselves. And we're a team of a pretty diverse background. I'm an architect by trade. We have technology uh, kind of funds and entertainment uh, backing behind us as well. So the big idea is that we see the building essentially as the next media platform. You know, you have a game, TV, we see as the building itself through a combination of projection mapping and sensors, creating a wide variety of experiences to draw people for various entertainment functions. And the way we scale that is that we approach each space as essentially a kit of parts. And we have areas that range from 2,000 square feet all the way down to 500 square feet. And they can hold up to 40 players that can play a game all at one time or down to two players. And the power behind that kit of parts is it allows us to take over almost any type of space from our our location in Albuquerque, about 24,000 square feet. Our second location will be in a mall location at 12,000 square feet. And we actually currently have a traveling museum exhibit that's the same kit of parts. And that opened in Detroit last week at the Michigan Science Center. So the types of content that we actually play within the building and the power of it is that it's all digital based and sensor. So we have interactive games, visuals, dining, and a wide variety of content. And I'm gonna just share a quick video here because uh, it's kind of something that's just easier seen than looking at pictures. But one of the powers behind the tech is that we don't require any headsets or special tracking. So we have a sensor network that we've built throughout the facility. So they just track your movement and motion throughout the space. So the walls and floors become interactive surfaces. And this allows us to really capture all ages. And so little kids typically will come in, their parents play, and then their parents' parents will kind of join in the action. And what's great is that we can facilitate these large groups all playing at one time. And so the game functionality, currently we can sustain up to about 48 players in some of our larger spaces and down to you know single individual games uh, within the facility itself. That same technology can be applied to our kind of immersive dining rooms. And so we have full commercial kitchen, full-time chefs, and we build and cater you know fine dining events. Uh, these are typically five course meals within an interactive party room where you can see the table reacting to the movement on that surface. And so we'll run seasonal content. You know, we're working on a big Halloween set right now that's going to launch in about a week. And outside of that, the other big opportunity that we found uh, has been really successful is corporate events. Uh, and so what we can do is actually white label the entire building. So when a company comes in, and there's some examples in here, like our local soccer team, New Mexico United, their colors are black and yellow. So we can actually transform the entire facility to black and yellow. Their logos spread throughout the, the space. And that accommodates, you know, a variety of events too. So we'll do concerts, performances. And the great power in that is that everything is controlled through our kind of custom developed software and uh, inter linking of the sensor network. And so with a click of a button, we're able to actually change this content. And so it's really a time of day based model. Uh, we tend to get revenue from a couple different sources. Uh, you can buy a general admission ticket for our daytime activities. And then all of the special events from dining, concerts, uh, we're, we're doing an immersive art experience right now. Those all have individual pricing outside of that. So I'm gonna kind of skip through some of these since we watched the video, but the last thing here, you know, the power behind being able to have a digital space is that we can actually program the content by time of day and that available demographic. 
So early mornings, we'll actually do fitness-based content. So from 6.30 to 10, that could be interactive yoga. A lot of our games, because you're the controller, you just will naturally break a sweat. And so there's physical activity built into that. And so that's driving our kind of early hours. In the daytime, it's more game-focused. Going into the evenings, we'll do kind of immersive art galleries, like a Van Gogh, except actually interactive. And then late night, you'll find more of the immersive fine dining. And then later night, up until two in the morning, is when you'll find uh, that concerts and music events on the weekends. So why a shopping center or mall owner finds that attractive is that in terms of the big box, that's where the Sears, Pennies, and other anchors have gone to the wayside due to e-commerce. And so these portfolio owners want to bring back that foot traffic. And so by having a digital space, we can drive that throughout the time of day. And we're able to kind of target what type of demographic they want, really based on the types of content that we're actually playing throughout the facility itself. And so in terms of our own development process, uh, because it's all managed in-house and we control the whole platform, you know, some of our content experiences can be developed in a week. Others could be about six weeks, but it's a very agile development process where we can take feedback, see how it's performing in the wild, and make changes on demand. And so we have a robust content library. We've got about 60 different experiences already built to date, and that includes the games, the dining, and a number of different immersive art experiences. Our untapped opportunity lies in any type of sponsorship or sponsored content. And so between a game experience and maybe a dining experience or an art show, we see opportunities where we can build kind of branded immersive experiences that could promote, you know, if it's Under Armour for our fitness programming, where it just provides a completely new opportunity in terms of experiencing a brand that's not just video and not other traditional media. And on our board is Craig Kornblau. He's an ex-Disney Universal president. And with that, we're looking strategically to start to target all of that IP within the studios that's been sitting on shelves, collecting dust and bring new life to that. So, for example, like a Ghostbusters Halloween experience or any type of movie premiere, we can have an experience where you're actually engaged and immersed within that environment. And so that's our strategy once we hit a certain number of units uh, as we start to kind of scale within that process. And through that scaling, we see big opportunity to reduce, you know, our costs because we kind of leverage a wide variety of projection equipment. The location in Albuquerque has about 60 projectors and about, you know, the same amount of sensors within the building. So our flagship location, we secured a deal with Simon Malls. This is their global number one store in the world. Uh, we're going to be right on the Vegas Strip. We're on the third level there. We're taking over a quarter of the facility. And this is really considered our national global launch. Uh, the location itself is about 12,000 square feet. So it's a consolidated and improved upon version of what we built in Albuquerque. And it has views of the Las Vegas Strip. We planned a projection map and light up the building at night. And so we have lots of opportunity. And Simon is interested in us in the fact that we can just draw and flex and change that content with the click of a button to really cater to their audiences that they want within that location. Uh, the facade of the building will reflect some of the experiences within there where the facade actually will react to your movement through a collection of sensors. And outside of that, you know, we also tend to do common area activations, uh, looking for more experiential stuff within the malls themselves uh, before you actually hit the anchor. And as I mentioned, we, we operate and support, you know, from design, you know, the architect in me, all the way to the operations, where a lot of other kind of immersive, or if you've seen them, kind of these traveling exhibits, they tend to just be, you know, a couple month duration and just don't have the long-term infrastructure to kind of support and manage uh, these types of installations. So as a company, we're doing actually two concurrent opportunities. Uh, we have the corporate base investment, which is equity in the company. That's through a convertible note. We're seeking three and a half million. That's essentially giving us runway to get Las Vegas open, which is slated to open next June. 
And then we're actually doing a unit level base investment where it's non-dilutive to corporate, but you'll get a pretty lucrative return in terms of a 20% return from the profit or your preferred return or 33% net profit. And our intention is to get a 3x return on that investment, and that ends the participation in that location. So this one is structured really in a manner to help us get us on the national and global stage and outside of our sandbox here in Albuquerque. Great. Thanks, Brandon. Jonathan, you have a question? Absolutely. Brandon, I appreciate it. I'm particularly about it, excited about some of the new ways you offer for brands to engage with consumers. I think that that opportunity to monetize IP in a new way is going to be a particularly exciting growth channel for you. Um, one question I do have, uh, Forum Shops is obviously an incredible retail location. It's also a little bit of an anomaly. The dollars per square foot there are massive. What are the characteristics that you need for, like, what makes up an ideal electric playhouse location, thinking nationally and internationally? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, obviously Forum Shops is more of a marketing play for us. That's going to get the name out there. Uh, really, we're looking at our growth strategies that just hit major markets first. It, typically, a population, likely over a million, will sustain a, an electric playhouse. And our strategy is really to kind of partner with Simon and just scale within their portfolio. They have a number of locations. They've already got two additional locations they'd want us to kind of consider and propose on, one in Pleasanton, California, and one in Florida. Also, Houston Gallery. sorry, there's three locations that they're looking at. And so the fact that it's a kit of parts allows us to be really flexible, which they like, because they, you know, they have a wide variety of spaces within their malls. And it allows us to kind of scale much faster with a partnership through Simon, who we could essentially roadmap the locations over the next five years. Very exciting. How do you think about defining your competitive set? Uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not familiar with any uh, of anyone else with a similar technical approach, but fundamentally you're competing for leisure time, right? Like who do you think of as the major competitors out there? Uh, you know, we kind of sit in a class on our own. I mean, it, of course, it's just the entertainment dollar. You know, is, is someone going to go do Top Golf? Are they going to go watch a movie? And so we find it as our appeal is that, you know, parents who have kids, I have three kids. I think our struggles to get them off Minecraft for an hour or so. And so we have a big appeal in the sense that they can actually get out of the game and step into the game. And this notion of just being immersed and getting out. And there's also that social collaborative play aspect where, you know, people had been locked up over the last two years. You know, there's a real energy and desire to get back out in society in some way and to have shared experiences. I think it's going to be a very powerful draw for us in terms of what we're doing. Long term, it's really that IP, taking those brands that people already know and love and then building experiences that they can step into themselves and be part of. Hey, Brian? Yeah. Um, how do I learn what's on? Uh, like in the sense that are you mostly dependent on foot traffic and, and versus if, if I walked by and I saw there's an art show going on, not interested in the art show, but I would be interested in the gaming or the, like, so how would I learn if I'm in a community where this is taking place? How yeah, walk-ups, so there's a couple ways. Walk-up traffic, you're walking by and you see us. We kind of present content almost like a movie theater. So you kind of see the time of day. Okay, uh, like a movie theater. But again, like a movie theater, if, it's, if I don't like what's playing, I don't go in. Is it a thing where, let's say... I'm in with a dozen of my family members, like, you know, we're, we're going through shopping or whatever. Hey, let's do something. Can we vote to do something that we want versus what's on? So the voting actually happens in the experience. So if it's a game-based experience, each area within the facility actually has several games within each footprint. And so we have essentially a playlist. So it, when you're in one of our 16 different areas, you can actually browse a collection of games. So if another family is playing a game, it kind of gives you that control and gives you an opportunity to one, learn that the space is actually changing. You know, early on we had issue where you could walk through the games and play them for half an hour and think you're done. 
but the whole idea is that we're constantly changing that content. And so it's key to kind of build that functionality so you can browse and choose your experience. But for our timed experiences outside of our general admission, like an immersive art event or a concert, those tend to be later in the day. Anyway, we try and reserve basically from 10 till about 7 p.m. is just general admission, gameplay, family, entertainment. Um, real quick, because I know we're almost out of time. Um, Esports in the sense that you mentioned the um, IP of like movies and Disney and things like that. But what about like as a venue for watching or staging a Fortnite style competition? Yeah, we've done that. Uh, so we've we actually host a wide variety of events within the space. And, you know, we essentially turn all of our large projection areas, some of them being like 20 feet in height, 60 feet in width, you know, twice the size of a movie screen. And we live stream a wide variety of stuff. So we have a whole technical team and that's the advantage of operating is that we've hosted esports. Uh, last month we did drone racing, first person point of view. And they, that, person who was renting the facility wanted to see the perspective of the drone on the walls. And so our team was able to work with them. And so it just brings a lot of excitement. People see this as a venue that they can just do something totally it's amazing. Plug and at, play for whatever you want to do, essentially. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a platform and we just see it, you know, like a, like a TV analogy, you know, you're plugging in your Xbox, your, you know, back in the day, your DVD or VCR, you know, it, it's that approach. Great. Well, thanks, Brian, for the questions. And thanks, Brandon, for the presentation. And that brings us to the end of our presentations today. I want to thank everybody who came today and joined. Appreciate the pitches and the questions from the investors as well. Those in the audience, we had a few questions come in. We'll try to get those answered and back to you as well. If anybody wants to learn more about 10 Capital, please give us a call. Love to hear about your fundraise coming up or your interest in investing in startups. With that, we'll go ahead and wrap it up for today. Thank everybody for joining and we'll go ahead and close it out. And I think we'll stay on the line with the investors for a quick debrief uh, to get some feedback. So thank you guys so much for joining. Thank you.